Hello and welcome to uh, our lecture, our first lecture on clustering analysis. Uh, this is the first of two lectures that we will have on this subject. Um, this one is uh, an introductory lecture. It introduces the basic concepts and algorithms uh, behind uh, a clustering analysis. And in the next lecture, we will actually go into two specific algorithms and see how uh, those two algorithms work. Okay, so diving into the subject, what exactly is clustering? Um, clustering is this idea of dividing data into groups. And um, we do that because sometimes there is inherent meaning uh, to doing such a such an activity. And, um, and, and in other cases, it, it serves as a first step. It's fairly useful to do this. Now, you might notice that uh, you might have come across clustering with uh, some other names as well, um, which so such as segmentation or partitioning. So uh, that's kind of why we have uh, I, I've written out all th three for you in this uh, first bullet point. Um, but the core idea is the same. Um, it, it's fairly interesting. Uh, it also partly what what terminology you wind up using uh, also has to do with uh, the context or the background. So typically something like segmentation is um, used more in a marketing sense. So when you're grouping uh, people uh, in uh, or, or customers, sometimes people use the word segmentation. Uh, partitioning, uh, again, interestingly comes more from the computer science community where uh, you're, you're breaking up graphs. So you're partitioning graphs. Um, <clears throat> but again, the core idea is that you have some data and uh, that you, you, you're taking the data and based on certain properties of this data, um, you you choose to group it, so you can you can think of it as actually grouping data objects based on various attributes associated with this data. Um, the idea behind such an activity is that the data the data itself is represented through various attributes or features, and some data points are similar to others based on these attributes or features, right? And you want to group those that are similar and put them into one cluster or group um, and, and differentiate that from other groups or clusters which are similarly formed uh, based on some measure of similarity. So um, the, the core idea is to put things that are similar together and Therefore, as a result, um, the different groups are as dissimilar from each other as possible. So uh, data points within a group are similar and data points between groups uh, as a result are dissimilar to each other. Now, a core idea that clustering often relates to um, and, and sometimes is often confused with is uh, classification. Right. Um, I think an important thing to recognize here is that clustering is primarily uh, seen as an unsupervised learning technique, okay? Whereas classification is a supervised learning technique. The the idea is that you have some in, in with classification you have some input data, and you use the historic input data and the, uh, a specific output. And in the case of classification, the output actually it has classes, right? It's it's a categorical variable. Um, and so you used some kind of supervised learning technique to look at the relationship between these input variables and um, and and the and the task there is to make a prediction and and assign it a class um, in the case of clustering you are again dividing the input data space in some sense um, into groups but the groups are not based on labels that have been explicitly given f to you so in some sense there is no output uh, variable um, with clustering and wh what you have is only the input data space and it's not even clear that there is another there's a classification scheme like in the sense of the cl in the classification there was this output variable um, and this output variable had one two three or more uh, categorical states so there was there were these states that or labels that was explicitly given to you and you were now trying to create that relationship between these labels and the input variables. In the case of clustering, um, not only do you not have the labels um, or, or the output variable, it, it, there might be no meaning 
to having such labels so in some sense with clustering you are really breaking the data input data uh, data uh, set based on the inherent relationship between data points and how similar they are to each other you don't have an external label that is uh, given to you about the data points so if two data points uh, are very similar across these attributes um, then then you group them together if they're not you group them apart so in the in the end you might create a few clusters and you can call them cluster a cluster b cluster c but that's not the same thing as classification which is more of a supervised learning process okay so why really do this and and the best way to see that is um this broad there are two major reasons one is clustering itself might just be useful to understand the universe of the data that you're dealing with and we're going to look at some examples in in that light the other reason and and sometimes this that clustering is used is that it it serves as a precursor to further data analysis um so it has some utility uh, from a machine learning sense itself um to do a clustering so now let's look at the first case which is that uh, in some sense uh, you get a better understanding of your data when you do clustering a fairly common example of this is in marketing or sales um where businesses for instance collect um you know lots of information about a customer so a, the way you should be thinking about it is each data object uh, is essentially a customer um and the customer has for instance various attributes and they could be uh, things like gender age and you know it could extend all the way to the kinds of products that the person tends to buy and so on and so forth um and you you have a full data set of a lot of customers or potential customers uh and you might be interested in grouping them right so there's no explicit output variable but certain types of customers are very similar to certain other types of customers so they could be very dissimilar to uh, a third type so creating groups uh, out there um, could, could could help for instance like uh, a market research initiative into looking into a particular group and coming up with ideas of how to specifically target or market to them another example uh, uh, you know another uh, fairly common example is in terms of just communicating information right um take a simple example uh, such as uh, googling or uh, you know searching for uh, a a movie on 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 the internet now there are lots of things related to a movie for instance they could be reviews of a movie they could be trailers and videos of a movie um they could be uh ratings of a movie and they could be information on which theaters the movie is running in or where you can purchase the movie now a a search itself a first search itself across the web uh might give you a huge uh large bucket of things that could belong to any of these uh categories um but if you had an ability to for instance look to see which pieces of information are similar to each other uh you might be interested in representing one of each type right so uh you you might have a cluster that is created which uh talks about essentially reviews of a movie uh and another cluster that uh, of uh, of potential links uh that talk about where this movie is playing and so in some sense you have you you could create these clusters and uh, present the viewer or present the person who's searching with a, a a representative of each cluster or typical value in each cluster so that uh, so that a person who's searching for a, for a review of the movie does not get 20 links on the first page that give him trailer give him or her trailers um which would be quite frustrating so in terms of information retrieval and communication of the information um it might be fairly useful clustering is used a lot in biology uh mainly in taxonomy uh where uh, if you just said the wild universe of mammals or insects or something like that um you 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 kind of want to uh group animals or uh mammals that are similar to each other and give them some taxonomy that is different from animals that are different from each other and here for instance each animal would be the data object and the attributes would be you know various uh animal related attributes such as uh how they feed what 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 their family or genus or species is and so on and so forth um it's also used in climate 
uh, many times understanding uh, understanding ocean temperatures ranging from ocean temperatures to hurricanes to um, various other things can be better done um, you know if if you if you cluster the data uh, on on weather patterns um medicine of course uh, again are certain types of disease similar to other types of disease are certain medi- medica- medicines similar to other medicines it can uh, simplify the world in some sense and help people understand how for instance certain medicines interact with certain disease and so on and so forth now um these give you an understanding and these to kind of talk about where clustering is useful or has been used uh just to get a better sense of the data um but there is this completely uh different and uh, other utility sometimes to cluster clustering and that's um mainly in, in the form of serving as a precursor to further data analysis um the idea here is that um clustering for instance can be used as a, as a great way to summarize data especially when the algorithm that a person needs to use let's say a person was interested in performing some form of a regression or um another more complex uh, supervised or unsupervised learning task sometimes um with more and more data the task just becomes computationally harder and harder and it might be sometimes beneficial to perform a clustering analysis on the data which could be in some cases it it's computationally easier to do the clustering and then just have a representative from each cluster as a data point so you could have a representative or you could have essentially the cluster center uh, the 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 cluster's representative um serve as a data point for all the data points uh in that cluster and so you're now doing that same uh, machine learning task be it a regression or a uh factor analysis or whatever it is um you're really doing it on the prototypes on on the representatives rather than the full data set um it's also used uh, i mean an, an an extension of that is also how it could be really useful um like say in, in a nearest neighbor task right um we in, in an earlier in earlier lectures we've spoken about this al- algorithm called knn right k nearest neighbors um i mean when you think about the problem that's involved with that um for any given point if you if you need to find its nearest neighbors you need to actually try and look at the distance between the point under question and every other point in the data set so you need to evaluate the distance between the point you're interested in and every other data point and then pick the k closest neighbors uh now that can become computationally very 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 hard um and and you know you need to keep either a memory or you need to do the computation from scratch uh, a simpler approach could be uh that you just take the k the you, you do a clustering on the data and you look to see um which cluster center is closest and once you identify a cluster center that's closest you now take your point under question and only evaluate its distance to all the points in that cluster um and the assumption here is that uh, the the points the the points under that cluster are the ones that are going to be closest to this point because this this cluster center was the closest for instance it's also used in certain other forms of uh, you know compression of data um, specifically something called vector quantization uh, which is used a lot in um, image or sound or video data where you typically find that like in in a particular image if you break it up into pixels um there is a whole host of data points that will look very very similar to each other um so you take a, let's say you take a photo of a person uh, right uh, almost 20 to 30% might be the background behind the person and that might have the same color so uh, it would be more efficient to just acknowledge that uh, there's a very good chance that the pixel on all four sides are going to be the same color as this pixel and so you kind of summarize the data you reduce the data to a fewer number of uh, pixels and uh, memory values and obviously with this there's some loss of resolution right there's some loss of information essentially uh, but that might be acceptable um and then the data size itself gets substantially reduced okay so we we spoke about 
what clustering is and why uh, use it. Now let's just briefly talk a little bit about the different types of clustering. Um, the major classifications tend to be one uh, hierarchic, hierarchical versus partitional and the the major idea but here is that hierarchical clustering is essentially a nested form of clustering right so think of it this way um, you can start with this one mega cluster which is essentially a single cluster of all the data points um, and that's on one end of the scale and then you go to the other end of the scale where you have as many clusters as the number of data points and each data point is its uh, is a cluster is its own cluster now somewhere a hierarchical clustering works on creating this tree between a single cluster of all data points to each data point being its own cluster. Now either of these extremes are useless, uh, uh, right? Um, because a single cluster of all the data points is not really clustering. Um, you've just created, you've put all the data points in one group and called it group one. Uh, that's not very useful. Um, and neither is it useful to call each data point its own group, right? Um, so somewhere in between these two extremes uh, is the real value add. But hierarchical clustering works on, it's some form of uh, nested or kind of tree structure of clustering where you start with this one, you can, you can start at either end, um, but you might start with one large cluster and then break that into two. And now you have these two clusters. Now you go into either of these two clusters and break that into uh, create a division there. So now you will have three clusters. But the three cluster is strictly a division of the two clusters. So it's not like you're going to take some points from cluster A. When you had two clusters, let's say you had them as cluster A, cluster B. It's not like you're going to take some points from cluster A, some points from cluster B and call it cluster C. Um, it's in that sense nested. It's in the sense that you, you make one split and very very similar to deci decision trees um, you keep making further splits um, and this is contrasted to uh, an, uh, an approach of partitional clustering um, partitional clustering is not this kind of nested uh, approach it's just that you explicitly um, decide on the number of uh, clusters in some sense and you go and partition the data it's, it's, it's simply a division of the set uh, into uh, non-overlapping uh, sets or essentially clusters and so in that sense there is no tree diagram or uh, anything of that uh, nature with this. So for instance uh, a partitional cluster um, that if I decide to do a partitional cluster and create four clusters um, and, and I contrast that to a partitional clustering approach where I had three clusters, the four need not be a further division of the three. They, they're just completely, uh, a, you know, the one that said f decided to break it into four has uh, very little or no relationship theoretically to the division, the separate exercise or the separate effort into creating a partitional cluster with three clusters. Whereas the same cannot be said for hierarchical, right? Because the hierarchical went in sequence. Um, it could have started top down or bottom up, meaning it could have started with all in hierarchical all the individual um, clusters where it's each day some di uh, you know each cluster is its data point, and then started grouping them um, or the other way around. But uh, essentially, uh, with hierarchical one is nested into the other, and so on. The other major um, type of clustering. Um, that people talk about is exclusive versus overlapping versus fuzzy. Um, the idea here is with exclusive clustering uh, each object is, is assigned to a single cluster uh, and that object therefore cannot be assigned to another cluster um, and, and so there's no uh, there's no notion that one can simultaneously belong to uh, multiple clusters. Whereas in overlapping, uh, uh, in in case in clustering algorithms that allow for overlapping, um, you can. Basically, it's not exclusive. A data point can choose to belong to um, more than one cluster at a given point. Um, and uh, the decision on which of these uh, really depends on the underlying system. 
right? In some cases, it might just make sense to uh, have some data points belonging to multiple clusters, and in some in some cases, um, that that notion of division is just nonsensical. Um, and finally, you, you have the notion of fuzzy clustering. Uh, fuzzy clustering kind of takes this overlapping uh, even further, where each data point is not really assigned to a cluster, um, but it basically gets a number between zero to one um, that that talks about the weight uh, associated with that data point belonging to the different clusters. Um, so for a data point, each data point gets uh, a total weight of one, and it takes that data that weight of one and says, "I'm going to assign 0.3 in belonging to cluster A. I'm going to assign 0.7 uh, in belonging to cluster B, and I'm going to assign myself zero in, to belonging to cluster C." So the constraint is that the sum of its weights in in terms of belonging to the different clusters uh, adds up to one, um, but it can use its weight of one in any way it chooses uh, to belong to the different clusters. So that's to give you some idea between of exclusive versus overlapping versus fu fuzzy. Um, the last uh, that's worth mentioning is uh, you you can also have a complete versus partial clustering. Uh, a complete clustering basically just assigns every object to a cluster, whereas a partial clustering um, does not. It 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 starts with the data points, chooses to you know cluster. Um, as many points to different clusters and data points that don't really help in terms of belonging so clearly to uh, a given cluster are just not clustered they just left out um, and and these might uh, and and the motivation there is that you're more interested not in kind of pigeonholing each data point into a cluster uh, but you're more interested in the cluster formation itself and and there you don't want data points that are not so clusterable that don't really belong so clearly into one or one of two clusters to kind of ruin the cluster center or ruin that uh nice um, division that you've created okay so these are certain different types of clusterings um now the algorithms themselves and and these are more descriptive of the type of algorithm that goes into it now uh Another area of focus could be the kind of clusters that you're forming, um, and while th this has everything to do with the algorithm, also here we're just looking at the end product. Um, so the algorithm that you're using, what kind of an end product does it uh, can it give you? Um, so the, the first one is the well-separated idea. The, the idea with the well-separated is that you want to create clusters where your, the objects. Um, where each object is similar to every other object in that cluster, right? So the way you're defining well-separated clusters are is more from the core idea that you're very interested in looking at the relationship between each data point with respect to each other data point, and you're measuring or you're quantifying uh, the, the 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 clustering itself by looking at how similar that data point is. To the other data points that are in that cluster, and, and therefore how dissimilar this data point is to the data points that are in the other clusters. And this kind of thinking, uh, you know, is 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 very useful, especially when the data itself can be very nicely separated. When the distance between um, the the clusters are fairly significant, then this conception becomes very useful. The prototype-based approach really talks more about how each data point is close or to its cluster representative. So, I, I, the the commonly used terminology is to the prototype that defines the cluster, um, and 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 when I describe it, I kind of try to think of it as there's a cluster. And there's there's the the main representative of the cluster, the 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 prototype, the the one that kind of signifies that's what the cluster is, and this is the center of the cluster. So in the prototype-based approaches, um, because this representative is in some sense so central, 
Uh, it's also sometimes called center-based clusters. Uh, but the idea is the following, where each data point um, is looked at more from the perspective of how close this data point is to the cluster center, to the prototype, and how far this data point is from the prototypes of the other clusters or the other representatives. And the classification is uh, done in this fashion. You then have the graph-based clustering. And this is really useful if the data is represented as a graph. And you have nodes which uh, are represent each data point uh, or object. And you have these links or edges which represent uh, some notion of connection between the data point. And this notion of connection could be the one that talks about how similar a data point is to the other data point. Uh, you could have some kind of a threshold value, uh, or especially when sometimes your variable itself is uh, not quantitative variables. You, you, you could have some uh, notion that two data points are connected. And the idea here is to do some graph-based clustering, where you're really looking for a high density of connections between data points that belong to a cluster uh, and a very low uh, low level of connectivity of the data points between two clusters and for that reason you know uh, there's this whole language that comes from the graph theory community um, where you define things called cliques um, which essentially just means that the set of nodes in that graph are completely connected to each other and so a lot of the, the kind of clustering ideas that go into graph based clustering are ones that kind of look out for cliques and, and say oh these guys are all connected to each other so they must be a, a cluster. Finally you have density based clustering. The idea behind density based clustering is that a cluster is essentially a dense region of objects that are surrounded by uh, regions of lower density. So the the idea here is that because there are not such well-defined clusters like in the case of uh, the well-separated uh, idea that you're not really looking um, to often do a complete clustering and there's a lot of noise in the data and uh, you know the clusters themselves are irregular or intertwined and there are lots of outliers and so on. Uh, so the idea here is that you acknowledge all of that, but you just try to identify spots of extreme density where once you identify that spot, that dense region becomes a cluster. And, uh, and, so, and so that's fairly useful in defining clusters where there is a lot of noise and so on. Okay, with that we will conclude our uh, lecture on um, lecture that introduces clustering and the different types of clusters and where it's useful and so on. Um, in the next lecture, we will look at two uh, basic algorithms. One is the k-means algorithm, uh, and that really belongs to that partitional camp. And we will look at another algorithm called the hierarchical uh, clustering algorithm, which belongs to the hierarchical camp. Thank you.